I often tell writers, you know, think like directors. You know, I mean, it drives me nuts when you're, you, you write something and they're sitting on the couch and the next thing is he takes a tomato juice out of the refrigerator. Well, how the hell is the director going to get him over to the refrigerator? Not only is he a writer, but he's a director, he's a producer, he's also known in the business as a showrunner. Please help me welcome the incredible, wonderful, talented, exceptional writer, Danny Kalis. So your first job in Hollywood was what? The first script ever sold was uh, To the Love Boat. And how did you get that job? My father was standing in a bank line and uh, he knew this guy in front of him. They started talking. It turned out he was a producer of The Love Boat. He says, my, my son's writing. He's got this, uh, this uh, taxi script he wrote as a spec. So he read it, and he called up, and he said, yeah, have him come in and pitch to my story editors. They were uh, two guys. They were great guys. Uh, and I pitched 20 different story ideas to them. They finally bought the 21st one when I was driving <laughs> home. I came up with an act break, and uh, they said, have we ever done that one? I don't think we've ever done it. Yeah, we might be able to make a story out of that act break. Oh, my goodness. And how did you go from Love Boat to Taxi? What happened was I, I had been uh, working at a place called the Great American Food and Beverage Company in Santa Monica. On Santa Monica. Monica. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, was yeah. A, I was a singing bartender. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I wrote about the place. Uh, it was the very first... Uh, original I ever wrote, uh, and it was a sitcom. And at the time, my favorite show was Taxi, so it seemed ripe. It was about a bunch of people who were not really waiters and bartenders mm -hmm. like Taxi, but they would all come out to, uh, to make it big, and none of them had. So I wrote it, and then, again, my dad, you're going to see a pattern here, uh, knew this guy, uh, Dave Davis, who um, was one of the uh, producers of Taxi and uh, creators of the show. I sent him my great American pilot, and he liked it, and we just started talking on the phone. He says, you gotta write a spec script for a show on the air. Since Taxi was my favorite show, and the show, I, anyway, I took an idea for my show, and I wrote it for Taxi, and he really liked it, and he had retired from Taxi the year before, so we sent it up the line mm -hmm. to a producer he had left behind, and I got a call from Ed Weinberger, who was running the show with, with Jim Brooks at the time. And he said, we have a show like this, but good job. So then I went and I wrote another spec one and submitted that one, and that one they bought. Wow. And how old were you then? Oh, God, that far back. Yes. Huh? Uh, I Can was, oh, my God, <laughs> I want to say I was 27. Oh, wow. Excellent. When I sold that. Excellent. Yeah. So then you got to work on Taxi for a while. Well, I was a freelancer. Okay. So I wrote, the, the second one I wrote, they bought. And then based on that, I became a hot young writer. Oh, okay. Because I like to say I started my career at the top. The top? Right. And it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> Not true, but okay. It still is just one of the best shows ever. You know, it got me an agent. It got me uh, interviewed over at Norman Lear's company, Wow. Uh, Tandem. They had two new shows, Square Pegs, and Beats had written. She was off mm -hmm. at Saturday Night Live. Right. And then they had another show called Silver Spoons. My friend uh, Leonard Lightfoot was on it. Oh, I, I love Leonard yeah. Lightfoot. Oh. <laughs> we worked on uh, the Jeffersons together. He went from the Jeffersons to Silver Spoons. Of course. Yeah, of course. he played the police officer. Yeah. I was the gang leader. That he tried to arrest, yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd cast both of you in a heartbeat. Yeah. Oh, Leonard was great. He, yeah. He came in and saved us. He, we needed a, a, well, so you know Silver Spoons, which is the show I worked on for five years. I did every episode except for the pilot, earned my supervising producer stripes. So now tell us, what is a supervising producer? We're all writers. Okay. It's all writers. In television, writers are king, not in movies. Right. But in TV, we're kings. And the reason is because in a movie, when you write a script and the script's done, they can take the writer behind the woodshed and beat him into an inch <laughs> of his life. 
And if they need something, you know, they'll get another writer to punch right, it up, but right. it's done. Right. They don't need you anymore after no, you've written it. done. Right. But in TV, at least it used to be, we had 22 episodes a year, sometimes more, which meant, oh my God, we need another script. We shouldn't have killed that writer. TV is where, for writers, at least for me, you know, I got to see my work every week, and it was great. Unlike a film where the director is king. Yes. The writer is king, and the director normally is a freelancer. Some, yeah, unless, the they're, unless they happen to have uh, been a part of creating the show, the way Jim Burroughs was a part of Cheers, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, they are mostly for hire. Okay. Usually, again, back earlier in the sitcom era, we had house directors, mostly one director that worked the show, so they were pretty well ensconced. Yeah, that was, uh, that's where TV needed, you need a script every week. And that's why uh, writers would move up the ladder. So you start as a freelancer. Uh, then after you freelance, you might get put on staff and you'd be called. When I first got on staff, they didn't even have a title. We didn't even get credit. The Guild finally fought for it and we got something called Program Consultant. So once we got that, then the next thing is you would be bumped up to, to a story editor. Now that's called an Article 14 writer. Okay. What that means is you're not just a writer, but you're working in a capacity above being a writer. You're editing other people's work. You're pitching stories. You're doing more. Then you get to being a producer. Same thing, Article 14 writer. So you're still functioning as a writer, but you're doing all these other producing functions. And is that different from the showrunner? All it is is now <laughs> after the producer, you then get bumped to something they call supervising producer because okay. they needed an additional title <laughs> before you could become an executive producer. Oh, okay. Who is the showrunner? Who is usually the showrunner. Okay. So you got on Silver Spoons. You were king there for five years. No, I was never the king. Oh, you were never the king. Never the king there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Never. Were you no, the no. prince? I wasn't even a prince. Oh, okay. I was, I was an earl. Okay. You okay. Know. <laughs> uh, now, I moved my way up to supervising producer, worked for some really great people and then a couple of not so great, uh, which you have to go through in this business. Became eventually, you know, the number two person on Silver Spoons. After that, I was still employed at, at Tandem and they'd have me on other shows. I did a show called The Charmings, which was a delight. Yes, I remember that and, on ABC. Oh, it was terrific. Rob and Prue, Rob uh, Stern, Prude and Frazier, they were the creators, exec producers of that show and uh, we had a grand time. From there, uh, when that show folded, I was sent over to work on Who's the Boss. Oh, okay. And it was on Who's the Boss over the course of four years that I went from just being a producer to being an executive producer, and Who's the Boss was the first show I ever ran. Wow. And then from there, you went to uh, Smart Guy, or did you No, do after... after Hanging uh, with Mr. Cooper. Yeah, after Who's the Boss, I ended up going over to do ha Hanging with Mr. Cooper, mm -hmm. which I ended up... With Mark Curry. With Mark the Curry, yeah. yeah. And I did that for show for a year. Then after that, I went back to um, work with Jim Brooks on a show called Phenom which lasted about a year, and uh, it was a great show, just didn't make it past that year, uh, and it was a chance to go back and work with Jim after working with him on, on Taxi. He was the big guy at that time. Yes, he, he, he what, was. What was something that you learned from him as a writer, as a, maybe as a producer? What, what, what did you take away that you still use today? From basically all the people who, who were formative. Um, my uncle, Stan Kalis, who was one of the great producers of television uh, through the golden age of TV, from the Dick Powell Anthology series to uh, Mission Impossible, Hawaii Five-0, Police Story, the whole, I mean, what I learned from him and the writers that would work with him is, uh, and from Dave Davis, and then from Jim Brooks, uh, they all had one version of the thing that, that Dave and Jim both said to me, uh, which is, uh, you know, stories are hard, scripts are easy. And that is in no way to denigrate the significance of writing the actual teleplay or screenplay. In fact, once you've got your story, then the hardest thing to do is the screenplay and the teleplay. But it's about story. You've got a good story, um, it's everything. What makes a good story? Uh, well, let's start with there should be a beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> you know, Why? no matter how short, no Why? matter how long. Why? Because it needs to move you, and if it doesn't move you, 
then what's the point? Okay. And, you know, it's action. It's active. You know, you need an active premise in a story. You know, we were talking about uh, West Side Story and Romeo and Juliet, you know. Arguably, uh, the, the, the active premise there is true love conquers all, even in death. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an active premise. It suggests a beginning, middle, and end to your story. No matter what form or format, whether it's a, a commercial, whether it's a, a TV show, a movie, a, you know, a book, these elements need to be there. Uh, and they all stem from your character and whatever journey or conflict that they were uh, uh, sent down. Uh, I, I, when I worked for my uncle many years ago as an intern, which means you don't get paid, and I got to hang out with these amazing writers, one of them a fellow named Eric Berkovici, and they'd all gather together like at the, 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 the lunch table like it was the Algonquin, you know? The, the Algonquin was an incredible hotel in New York. Yes. Where, was it uh, uh, Parker? Um, uh, Dorothy Parker, Dorothy Parker Hemingway, Fitzgerald. Yeah. Would, would hang out at, yes. He gathered around, he told the story of this young exec at a studio who, very much, you know, wanted to, to, to make a big score with his first movie, so he, he, he locked himself in his screening room. He had uh, them run all the, the great movies, you know, Academy Award winning movies, and he emerged, and he gathered his writers together, and he said, I have found the secret to all great movies. Okay, what is it? And he goes, conflict! <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's... That's what you need. Always. Always. In writing and in acting. Mm -hmm. You gotta know what you're playing, and you gotta know why you're you're there. Absolutely. I mean, a, a lot of times when I'm talking with writers, I'll, I'll they'll write a scene or they'll write some dialogue, and I'll just say, "What am I supposed to tell the actor? They want in this scene, because I don't see it. There is a magic and alchemy that simply occurs in our in our business, which is that." moment where you get a great story, a great script, and then you cast it. And it is in that casting where the magic happens. Uh, it just, it is, it's, it's something you just got to know or feel. Um, it's why I hate casting. Really? Oh, well, if it's my work especially. Because I'm listening to all of these actors come in, most of them really good, and my work sucks. It's not funny, it's depressing, and I go, okay, they're gonna find out I don't know what I'm doing, and then that one actor walks in, and it's funny, and it's entertaining, and I'm going, oh my God, I'm a genius. That's the collaboration, isn't it? It's completely the magic of, of the right actor and just channeling the role. As you were breaking down the different um, job descriptions of a writer on a sitcom, you mentioned the story editor. So, in as the story editor, do you edit the writing? What is the function of a story editor? Well, again, the simplest way to think about it is everybody's a writer in TV. Mm -hmm. for the most part. There are non-writing producers, but everybody is a writer. Uh, we are all doing story editing at any given moment. Okay. It's really just a way of, of creating a chain of command. Okay. It's that So simple. it has nothing to do with the actual editing well, of the script. There is a distinction, usually. Um, everything's been blended or, or, or you know, uh, it's less defined. But usually when you are a story editor, you're working on other people's scripts, you're helping with the development of it, you're doing rewrites, um, but you're not doing editing and you're not doing casting. Okay. When you become a producer, then you tend to get into produce uh, okay. the, those other functions. And how did you get into directing as a writer? How did, how did It was late in the career. Uh, I was working with... Jim Brooks on Phenom at the time. He was doing his movies, so he would just come for run-throughs and give me notes on some of the uh, edits, some of the reading. Uh, after watching me work on the floor and then seeing what I did in, in the edit room with the shows, he said, you should try your hand at uh, directing. I said, okay. So I gave myself the last assignment of the year and directed that episode 
wish I'd given myself an easier episode, but uh, it was the last one, and it went pretty well, and I was utterly dependent on uh, my crew. I think it made me a better showrunner, made me a better writer, because for the first time I'm sitting down there on a set, and I'm getting pages from my writer's room, I'm looking at them going, what the hell do they want me to do now? Actors are confused. The crew is going, "How are we going to do this or that?" And it, it just it was it was it was a uh, it was it was a great experience. Would you suggest that all writers um, direct a piece just to get the feel of what what it entails to put their words up on its feet? Yeah, it's a, if you can get if you can do it, great. But you don't have to. Not required. It's okay. a whole. Uh, it's just not. It's a whole other thing. Yeah. You know, um, I tend to think visually, uh, right that way, um, so uh, it was it was sort of natural for me. Uh, others, you know, they the writers are, are not oriented in that okay. fashion. Other writers are much more uh, dialogue or story. You know, it just it it really is where you're, where it takes you. The thing about this business is is that yes, you need one person in charge, one person who. You know, you can oversee everything. And can be blamed. <laughs> uh, but you require an incredible amount of collaboration to make it work. It's like building a house. Mm. As a writer and then producing, what do you love about producing? Because doesn't it take you away from writing? Yes, that's what I love about it. Oh. <laughs> so you're the showrunner. Yeah. And then you just check on people to make sure they're writing. Is that is if that I'm that doing works? my job? Okay. Yes. I love producing because it, it 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 allows me to stretch all the muscles. It allows me, you know, to to um, uh, not just come up with the idea, but develop the script. But then to cast it, uh, when I drew, when I, when I, when I did Sweet Life, the, the art director comes up and he says, basically, what do you want the set to look like? I often tell writers, you know, think like directors. You know, I mean, it drives me nuts when you're, you, you write something and they're sitting on the couch and the next thing is he takes a tomato juice out of the refrigerator. Well, how the hell is the director going to get him over to the refrigerator? You know, think in terms of entrances and exits. Where's the point of attack on the scene? You know, where are you coming in? You know, uh, all of these things you get to initially stretch when you're writing the script. But then when you get to sit down like with the art director and say, okay, here's where my entrances and exits are, I, I drew the basic map mm -hmm. of what I wanted that lobby to, to look, look like. like. Yes. And then he brings it back. And there's nothing better. It's just such a great feeling that you can say to people, I want this, and they bring it to you. Well, that's the nice part about uh, being the exec. You get to cast it. Uh, you also then are down on the stage. You're giving notes to your director about how you want it shot. No, I don't want the camera there. I want it over here. No, don't, you know, I need a cut here for this single. Make sure I've got it. And then you get to go into editing and do the editing, which is the last rewrite. Make no Very mistake. Very well put. It is the last Very rewrite. Very well put. When I was working as an intern with my uncle, uh, he went in on a Saturday to re-edit. This is when they had those movieolas. He went in to re-edit something because the star, this guy named Michael Parks, he was a, right. a James Dean wannabe. Mm -hmm. So he went, Mom, we were lying like this, and you couldn't understand anything that he was saying. Or just, you know, please, come on, talk. So my uncle went in, he, he had graduated UCLA film, he re-edited the film with the thrown over his shoulder, running the movieola, so that all the angles were changed where we needed to loop the dialogue. So we were on his back as much as possible. Wow. And that's when I went, oh, you can do a lot in editing. Yes, you can. And so uh, that, that's the other thing you get to do. And that is the joy of being an exec producer. Uh, when I did Sweet Life, we had uh, a little, what, a Jaden Smith, uh, Will Smith's kid mm -hmm. on the show. He had just, uh, he had just done this movie with his dad, and I was getting dressed one morning, and he was being The interviewed. Pursuit of Happiness. Yeah, and he was being interviewed on, on, on Good Morning America, and they said, did you like doing the movie with your dad? And he said, yeah, yeah, I did. You know, well, what do you want to do next? And he said, well, I'd like to be on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. <laughs> 
And I went, oh, I picked up the phone. I called the agent. I said, uh, I called my producer. I said, Jaden Smith wants to be on The Sweet Life. Tell him I'll write a role for him. That's both the beauty of being a showrunner, that you can do that yes. in that moment, yes. right? And then he came and he did the show. Well, the point of the story is, Will hung out on the set the entire time with his kid. And so we got a chance to talk. And he, of course, had done Fresh Prince, and now he was a big movie star. And I asked him, I said, what do you like better, Will? Movies or TV? And he said, oh, that's a tough one. He said, the thing about TV that I love is that you are like doing a high wire act. You start on a Monday with a script. You rehearse it all through the week. You make it better, you rewrite it, and you just work it until you got it right. And whether you've got it right or not, come Friday night when that audience is in there, you shoot it. And sometimes it's through the roof, and it's a great high. Other times you go, thank God we're coming back next week and we get to do it all over again. And he said, there was nothing quite like that ride. And I would agree with that. But movies, he said, you can work it. You can really work every scene till you mm -hmm. get it right. Um, and that, that was a great joy to be able to perfect something like that. Of course, with his movies, he's got the budget to do that. Others, but it was a great point. Right. That, that was part of the excitement. Right. Uh, of doing TV is that you get to keep doing it over and over again. And so as the exec, I get to be a part of all of that. Um, and I get to delegate. 